Jump, jump in, Vijay. I, you know, I've been listening to your music for such a long time, and already from the early Rudra stuff. And you know, I was really interested. Of uh, you know, I'm a musician and composer, and uh, like how you write, especially. You know, I, I I've made my lead sheets of your tunes, which are probably like wrong <laughs> the way I interpreted them. But uh, you, you know, what's your procedure or process when writing music and uh you know some things made sense for me like you know aftermath i wrote okay five four or whatever like the older stuff i kind of figured out what was happening nine plus seven like imagined nations or but then you have something like headlong which or like a lot of field work stuff which confused me <laughs> you know how do you write a tune i'll put it like that <laughs> make it short like how just how do you write it um, like what's your process there or you know i've over all these years i've tried probably every every method <laughs> there's not one way that it happens uh thanks for you know your kind words and your interest and in, and in for checking out all that music mm. um, uh, I think in that period that you're referring to, the mostly early 2000s, um, early, like the, the aughts, as we call them, the zero zeros, <laughs> yeah. uh, that um, a lot of that music was driven by a kind of desire to challenge myself and, and, and also a sort of collective interest in similar um challenges or similar topics or problems i don't know what else to call them mm, um yep and i guess i i sort of figured out a long time ago when i and so i'm 51 so i'm you know like i've kind of been hacking away for 30 years <laughs> at uh it, like or more even like 35 years of like trying to write my own music and play it somewhere in public or build stuff together with other musicians um i think like because i you know i think i was probably writing music when i was about 16 or so oh. and i think like be after a while i was like you know there's this phase i went through when i was just like listening to a lot of stuff and then trying to write stuff that was similar to what i was hearing you know um i remember like harrison blanchard like terrence and, mm -hmm. and donald their yeah. first out al first albums had a bunch of like interesting weird challenging things with like rhythm and uh vamps and different things i remember like um dave holland's music or sure. or like uh you know joe henderson for i'm talking about the late 80s early 90s um jerry allen's music mm. um just anything i would hear i would try to be like well maybe i can do something like that it, you know it could be anything it could have been like strayhorn you know, like, well, let me see if I can kind of approach that, like, harmonic richness or, you know, it could be anything, really. But um, but it was this very imitative kind of mode. Mm. And then I was like, well, it was my own thing. And, you know, I can't just do that forever. Um, so then I was, like, trying to write from within, in a way. And I found in doing that, that I, after a while, I was repeating myself. Mm you know, that um, you kind of run out of resources, musically yeah. speaking, like you run out of material, you run out of ingredients, you know, um, or you start reaching for the same handful of tricks or like, you know, uh, if you just like sit at the piano and try to like fish around until you find something, you'll keep finding the same stuff. Like that's kind of what I came to believe. Um, yeah. Or I, found, I found, you know, I found it happening. I saw it happening in myself. So then, um, then I started like pushing myself to reach outside of myself instead of into myself only, you know? Um, in, in what sense? So that, 
so that like initially you know so in the early mid 90s i was um checking out a lot of other musical uh you could say traditions or cultures yeah. or whatever like um i was studying west west african drumming this man from ghana from the anlo ewe cultures of ghana of, of ghana in Ber this is in berkeley california um i was uh starting to check out Karnataka and hindustani music in earnest like try to understand what's going on in it you know mm. um i was checking out electronic music i was yeah. um i had already been like a hip-hop fan for like by then probably 10 or 12 years and then you know like then i started playing with hip-hop musicians and electronic musicians i was also checking out contemporary composers mm. and uh different like strategies they would use for organizing music uh basically trying to learn f um from within like what was going on in these yeah. different systems you know and of then i was also playing with a lot of elder musicians in the sort of in the oakland scene you know so i was so then it was like a lot of drummers that i was playing with in fact like uh, donald bailey was one mm, of them really oh wow he's you know yeah and the other i played in his band for years actually really? and all we did was rehearse at his house <laughs> like every week wow for years <laughs> well, okay. so i wasn't even really rehearsing it was actually just like stretching out on music another drummer who was pivotal for me in those years was this guy ew wainwright mm. who was uh he had been like a kind of protege of elvin oh okay in the 70s and um and he toured with mccoy and with pharaoh instead really? in the 70s know. and okay. 80s oh. and uh so i was playing in his band for some years as well in the 90s and then i was getting exposed to like aacm people uh roscoe mitchell yeah. george lewis Wadada Leo Smith and to Steve Coleman and his whole world um and I started touring with him so like seeing all these uh different approaches to putting music together um uh this wasn't like imitating from the outside it was actually like from the inside from the building blocks uh, a kind of compositional mentality with the fundamentals you know mm -hmm. um so it was really that it wasn't like writing tunes then you know it was actually um trying to generate systems of for organizing or yeah. for like generating or for like uh elaborating on different ideas you know so so for example a lot of the things that I was into around that time had to do with different rhythmic systems or rhythmic traditions. Yeah. This is in the nineties. And then like it kind of fed into my early two thousand stuff. Um, you know, particularly like a lot of what I checked out in Carnatic and Hindustani music was about rhythmic techniques. Yeah. And then I was also steady and those were a certain mentality, a very kind of like additive, I guess I would say, um, in the sense like different linear elaborations of rhythm you know often you know generally in the context of meter yeah uh, you'd have like kind of permutations and combinations of figures um over across time you know across measured time yeah then i was you know also studying west african and afro-caribbean stuff um uh like you know the, the stuff i had studied from ghana or like Afro-Cuban stuff that I got involved with a little bit. Um, getting, you know, getting a sense of the sort of, these are more co compact forms that were very layered, you know, so yes. it wasn't this linear sort of like um, serial kind of thing. It was more like a, all these things happening in parallel that it was, so then it was like rhythmic counterpoint, you know, um, 
So then I, I started thinking like, how can I combine those strategies, basically the sort of South Asian strategies and the West African Afro-diasporic strategies for building rhythmic stuff, built rhythmic systems or rhythmic yeah. uh, ideas, you know? Um, so that's to answer your question, finally. No, no, please. Uh, that's that's, where, that's, that's, that's cool. where, I guess that particular idea, like, okay, sort of like, the additive mentality from South Asian rhythmic traditions and the layering mentality from from uh, West African and um, Black Atlantic, you could say, or Afro diasporic traditions in the Americas. Um, those two things, those two elements together, kind of became uh, the the thrust of it i'd say in that period especially because then mm. it was like i'd start with a rhythmic idea you know like you know you're talking about it in terms of meter but that's meter is just like a blank space you know so it's yeah. like more about rhythm rhythms different rhythms kind of interacting um in the context of meter you know meter is not just a blank space meter is a sort of like implication about pulsation yeah about groups of pulses and some subdivisions of pulses all right yeah. so like having a, that kind of template but then it's about how rhythms interact with that sense of pulse and with those subdivisions of pulses so that's kind of what i was using to build music in those in those years i'd say and so all these things that you mentioned um yeah so like you, you mentioned headlong so that's an example right so it's it's actually very simple in a way because it's only it's just it's uh four you know it's four measures of seven the rhythmic template is four measures of seven with um uh and those sevens are three plus four all right or three mm -hmm. plus two plus two whatever yeah, you want yeah, to say. Yeah. um and these are going by pretty fast right like one per second you know one bar per second <laughs> yeah, about. Good, good. um and then across that yeah, yeah. so then that rhythm is six five six five six okay so that is this ABABA figure that lies across this more binary kind of thing and it's not binary exactly no, no, each, yeah. bar, each bar is seven but it's like four of them so it's 28 kind of like yeah. this yeah it's 28 yeah. sliced yeah. up a different way but in a particular way which is that you have this uh, basically the what you probably have heard of as t-highs or something like this kind of this rhythmic cadence yeah, yeah. Or, ryth rhythmic cadence basically where you play a figure three times and it resolves in the downbeat so that's a kind of um you know i remember steve coleman used the phrase rhythmic progression yep. or rhythmic voice leading even um you know, a phrase like that is kind of forcing you out of your your like harmonic centered universe, you know, and thinking more in terms of how rhythmic tension and release can also be a form, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of what I was trying to do with a simp that's probably one of the simpler it incarnations of it, even though musically it's not simple no, yeah, to play. Exactly. But it still yeah. has this sort of like because you have this cross rhythm it gives like it gives the thing a rhythmic identity you know um which is more the meter so that's kind of what i was after is like pieces that have a rhythmic identity that's not just about numbers of beats you know yeah yeah, that, that yeah. sort of like so that would come from rhythmic counterpoint or rhythmic contrast or rhythmic, rhythmic layers and then what yeah. was in those layers yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah super yeah. How, how did you how did you make you know you said you, you set up challenges for yourself in a way how did you feel you know when i listen to field work it's you know and uh taishan or uh doesn't help Elliot, <laughs> yeah Elliot. like they you know I, I mean they're incredible of course but like it's not like a simple beat like they're playing it's constantly shifting and like how, how did you f make yourself feel comfortable in that environment that you could actually improvise 
in a relaxed way <laughs> in such i mean or even now like you know it, of course now i'm not sure i was ever relaxed you know <laughs> when i listen back to those i'm like wow i'm dropping beats like constantly i don't, I don't know if i was ever really up to it um i think uh i would build you know like the way i tended to work on rhythmic challenges especially in my 20s was like um there was some like contrasting rhythm that I was trying to learn. I would just like walk around with it, you know? So, because like, actually the goal wasn't to be able to be burning, but actually just to be able to like coexist and function, you know, period. Like as, as a rhythm section player, it's like, can you yeah. function in this, in this rhythmic environment? And then beyond that, can you make it feel like something that like some uh, sort of invitation to move or to dance you know like yeah all the stuff that i was talking about earlier these aren't just math it's not just math it's actually like these are dance rhythms oh it's so groovy these man the music these are it's... dance dance traditions that yeah. i study you know like yeah. even when i was studying west african drumming we uh what it, the way it worked would we like go to the class we'd um work on learn these like rhythmic systems for you know it was like a drum ensemble so you'd be like stationed on one drum and you'd have like one rhythm and then that might shift to another rhythm but you'd have to hold it like really like carry this rhythm in in time and in yeah. in line with everybody and you couldn't zone out you know but then like you'd you'd have to do that you'd, you'd like study and learn this repertoire and then immediately you'd have to play for the dance class, like right after that, you know, wow. for the next two hours, you were putting it into practice in a way that like they had to feel it, you know? So it wasn't just um, theoretical. <laughs> it was really like... You had to do uh, it, yeah. And I remember, I'll never forget this one time, like, you know, I was on one of the support drums and we had like really humble material. It'd be like, just that like for 45 minutes you know and uh we were doing this so we were in that mode where we had learned these rhythms and then we were doing the playing for the drum for the dance class which the drum the lead drummer also taught by the way so and so he was demonstrating these movements that we were playing these rhythms and then he's playing the lead drum. And at some point, he just stops the ensemble and he points at me. I was just playing this, like, support rhythm, you know, had no... It, to me, it had nothing in it. You know, it was just, like, dots. It was dots and, you know, it was, like, binary kind of... Yeah, you know, yeah. like, it had no... <laughs> yeah. And he pointed at me and he said, you are bringing this whole thing down right now. Oh. You know, you have to give that rhythm life. You know, it's not just... Um, you know, he basically was like, this is where the life is, you know, it, right in that rhythm. And all of the, all of us, the interdependence of what all of us are doing in a way that has to really support human action and movement and joy and dance, yeah. you know, like that. Yeah. So that's kind of um, the mentality that I came from, you know, I'd say in terms of like, it, that really reset my, my uh, sensibility about rhythm or rhythmic uh, material in music is that it had to really serve the community like it really had to serve the the feeling of mm. dance and and, the, the, and it had to give people that feeling so that they could feel their way through the music you know and so like orienting myself that way rather than um mathematically only you know that's been like that's been key for me and so like often when i'm trying to internalize something new not that i'm a dancer but i'll just like walk around with it until i can really feel it in my body you know so that i can then if i can't move with it then how's anyone else supposed to sure. you know so like i have to get to the point where i can move with the rhythm move carry the rhythm in my body you know so that and then act from that place so that everything you do is reflecting 
that rhythmic animation um yeah so that that's kind of uh you know that's basically like what it would be you know for me it's not how everybody does it, how everybody sure. yeah, yeah. approaches these things and actually i would say that my music ends up in the long run being simpler than a lot of other people's <laughs> uh um uh, you know, i don't know like, okay <laughs> uh there's there's some hard stuff out there that i can't oh there is there is that, like, stuff, sure. that i won't even try to play or i don't you know i hope no one hires me to play <laughs> because it's just too uh it's not you know it's just like the um these aren't just brain teasers you know they're actually like invitations to to move and to feel that's basically how they are for me mm. interesting yeah but 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 still like you know you mentioned groove i, I when i listen to your music it's so groovy you know well, i'm glad i'm glad I mean, really, so. i mean it's always like know, this I, presence you know like even that's, if that's it's like great. something's missing uh, in a sense of a beat let's say for normal <laughs> yeah, people, i don't know i, I mean it like... you know my one of the best compliments i can remember is that, um this guy in spain told me he was playing an album of mine for his kid his child who was like three years old and they were dancing to it so it's stuff like that you know it's like that's that's actually a deeper compliment than 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 we might um normally take yeah. it you know like it's it's actually like you you tapped into something you know when that when you can actually make that happen yeah yeah, I'll do. I'll do that with my daughter. I'll put a, put on field work for her. <laughs> <laughs> Funny because like field work is maybe the one where we try to push the hardest no. in terms of complexity and yeah. and um, you know, a lot of it is just. And then you know, I should also say that I didn't write all of that music. No, no, I sure, so, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Steve, the, Steve did as well. The last yeah. one, door. There's actually half of it's written by Tashon. Tashon, so yeah, yeah. That's why you know that is probably the hardest music I've ever played in my life. And for him, it was like falling off a log. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's crazy. I, I did. I think I did one of his first European tours. He came to Europe with, uh, mm -hmm. I did a tour with him and Carlo De Rosa. Yeah. Uh, and I wrote like really long music, you know, and he, he like after the first gig, like 14 tunes changing meters all the time, he didn't need sheet music. We were driving in a yeah. car. He was reading like string quartets by Elliot Carter, or like yeah, 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 yeah it's yeah. so cool, man. Like I was like, man, shit, this is like, you know, I I felt like in the presence of really genius, like incredible creativity, and so, so no doubt, no doubt, yeah, yeah, no, I've felt that since day one. <laughs> yeah, day one for me is like two thousand or two thousand one. You know, ah, that's the first time. Okay. So, Oh. yeah 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 we've we've been we've been in this together remember? for a while you remember the first More than what was it? Years. well the first time we played together he, he came over to my place and um this was probably um it was 2000 or 2001 i can't remember oh. exactly but uh um we uh it was a similar thing like <laughs> i've told the story elsewhere but um you know i he brought his drums over I, I was sort of set up this exploratory trio session it was actually him and me and carlo in fact oh really um, oh, oh, oh oh cool uh and uh just because like i was my group was going through a transition I, I knew i'd need a new drummer and i just wanted to see where he was at you know hear hear what he was into and whether we could work together and um <laughs> I mean I've told the story in a few other places but like um you know he brought his drums over was sort of taking his time setting up and I was like okay I'm just gonna I just so I stepped out of the room for a bit and then I hear some piano playing oh yeah <laughs> I'm like and I'm like wait I know this oh that's me <laughs> he's playing me oh yeah so this must have been um it must have been fall of a fall of 2001 or maybe it was like fall or winter of 2001 I want to say maybe November around then um so just after 9-11 um right because that album 
it was from panoptic modes it was like yeah, yeah. a little <laughs> little slice of something i had played not actually the tune but some little element of my improvisation he was like playing it exactly <laughs> i was like uh <laughs> how did you know that yeah and then he started playing some other stuff that was like well so first of all like what he was signaling in that moment which he's talked about elsewhere is like um if someone asks you to play with them you have to you should actually do some research mm, like sure. study what they're doing study their work you know come prepared that was his little like i came prepared <laughs> you know i know you <laughs> message play yeah. shit back at you you know um <laughs> there there was that but then he was also he was just like ex doing some other stuff on the piano i was like um so what's that he goes well it's a it's one of the shock house and clavier stilke you know um yeah and then he started doing some other stuff like turning it around and then doing his own thing i'm like so what is that and he <laughs> goes well i'm sort of using uh these uh tone rows and improvising with tone rows you know so it was like using fully rigorous serialist no. methods in real time you know just stuff like that and then yeah like as you said like i gave him one page of music that was actually like it was like i said it had these layers on it in it you know it's actually it was the tune called when history sleeps which is on mm -hmm. blood sutra which he ended up being the drummer on that album um he looked at it for like a few, about 10 or 15 seconds and gave it back to me. And he still remembers it to this day, like yeah, 20, that's, 21 years later. That's crazy. Um, so, yeah, he's one of those type of guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's been great. You know what? That makes um, everything so easy and joyous, you know, because like you can at any moment conjure up anything from anything that we've ever done together you know yeah yeah and uh and i always know he hears everything i play like he hears and knows what it is so so when i it, it actually like in the context of trio music between him and linda who also has who actually has similar capacities you know as oh, really? like okay, shit, incredible okay. just like their ears and uh awareness of what's happening yeah um we can kind of do anything anytime you know we can just we don't have to have a set list because we can just move from one piece to another with no no cue no you know just like yeah, start, you yeah. know so everything has this like it's a new for me just a new level of um fluidity you know and um, mm. and i'm actually just like i just feel so blessed to be get to play with people like them, so. yeah in, in what sense do, do, do you see the you know especially speaking of your trios like this trio with linda at taishan and if you compare it to stefan and marcus i mean it's like a real progression also in your composing or maybe in a different direction like what made you change uh not change uh, yeah i mean it, it's you know it's not, what you what know, was the decision you based on this kind of next move or i'll put it like that well uh i actually what it, it wasn't a sort of moving away it was more moving toward you know like for me it was like we had a chance to play trio a couple times in 2019 and then it was like, hey, you guys want to make a record? Because <laughs> it sounded actually just, like I said, it just was so natural, yeah. um, ready to go. You know, and it had like this, its own energy, its own balance, um, kind of different. Uh, it offered a bit of a different um, way of organizing things for me because, well, for one thing, like, linda was just like never afraid to solo on anything you know so like you including just weird weird shit that i would write you know um she would just step in and then take a solo that i had to kind of then like oh i better 
<laughs> what do I play after that? You know, like, exactly, you know, yeah. so I'd have to like, it gave me a, a challenge to rise to. It was actually, I mean, I remember playing with Rudresh was kind of like that in a different way, but it was like, okay, I guess that's, we're there now. <laughs> like we've just kind of like ratcheted up the intensity in a way that I need to like rise to, you know? Yeah. And for me, I think that challenge was exciting. Um, and then the particular feeling of the beat of the two of them together that just had this life and this propulsion and excitement, you know, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that we have now developed. I mean, you've only heard the first album, but there's there's a whole other album that we made this year. That oh, really? Be, oh, oh, probably man. out. Probably will be out in the fall or something next year. On ECM again? And, or? Um, yeah. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, yeah, because we got to tour a lot over the last year or so. And the band kind of got to a new place through all of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, in, it's incredible with music. You, you, you know, I always find that the, the tradition of the piano trio, you know, going back to, you know, Chick and the the legendary albums, Bud Powell, whoever, you, you know, it's it's so key Jarrett it's so hard or any instrument f finds originality but you, you always i think when i look at your career it's like you seem to find your this next next step and you make it sound like oh this is something new again and i really admire that with you it's like oh well, thanks you know it, it's like um i think it's partly because i haven't generally approached it like um like a soloist you know it's been more like approaching it as a composer yeah or even as a curator you know like with trio with stefan and marcus there was obviously a lot of covers you know that were part of it um i mean there's always been covers in my repertoire it's not a new thing but i think well part of what happened when i started working with act with historicity which came out in 2009 yeah. is that they wanted a piece of my publishing I was like, hell no, I'm not giving you more of my tunes. Sure. So that's why I did a bunch of covers on those records. Oh, wow, okay. I not know. because like I was like, I'm going to show you all how to play standards. It wasn't that at all. It was actually just me trying to contend with that predicament, you know? Because at the time I was like, well, I need some way to get a foothold in Europe, you know? And so being on this European label was a way to kind of be able to tour more as a leader in Europe, which I, uh, you know, previously had only done in spot bits, yeah. like little moments here and there, you know. How did Ziggy approach After you? The... Did Ziggy approach you or like to do that record? Yeah, I can't, I think he came to hear us in, okay. I want to say in Cologne or something um, in 2009 in the, okay. we did a, tour in the winter like in february of 09 and he came to one of our shows and hmm. then like we recorded a month later you know hmm. um and so then also that meant that actually that record was put together really quick you know like in a in the in terms of repertoire <laughs> so we had a rapport because we had been playing together but we but the repertoire was like that's well, let's try you guys want to try this one you know like it was actually really very we didn't have any rehearsal time with that stuff we really kind of like figured it out oh. and very much in real time you know so uh it's quite yeah, a, ironic something. if you think about it like because you, you know you guys basically then you know brad did it before of course and but like you know doing this kind of other tunes in odd meters you basically provoke the whole new movement in the younger generation also like you know <laughs> the, the way i see it you know like, then everyone started like yeah okay let's do i don't know imagine in 11 or let's do you know this in seven and like people started and now you say it, it was like almost unintentional which is quite quite ironic well, it was it was kind of like a, a momentary solution yeah. to a sort of situation <laughs> that i had to was but it was also like essentially what I wanted to do was use the same kind of methods I was using in the, the previous albums, um, 
And you can actually trace the lineage of almost all of it. Yeah. You know, in terms of uh, what I, you know, the way we approach certain pieces on that, on those albums, you know, like, in fact, that version of Smokestack, we used to call it like Smoke Machine because there was a piece called Machine Days that's um, on Tragic Comedy, you know, and so it was basically like, okay, use the rhythm from Machine Days and we'll play Smokestack over, you know, this Andrew Hill tune over it and see how that works. Yeah. And then it just kind of became its own thing, you know, so that's an example. Um, and then later, like, uh, <laughs> um the uh the version of in, on on um a the Rondo. version of uh of uh star of a story right so each one of those is like each beat it's in four but each beat is a very fast seven so like the fact that it's all sliced up in his fast set templates you know and then that came there was a whole lineage of those pieces like that on um, reimagining there's a piece called cardio and then on tragic comic there's our cover of the bud powell tune coming up and and then like we took it we ratcheted it up even further for star of a story to the point where it was just this kind of like ecstatic saturation yeah. of, of rhythm you know mm -hmm. um but that came from a like I said, this is like I heard South Indian drummers doing this, you know. So it actually came from that idea. So it's all the same elements. I just kind of like use them to activate someone else's music. Yeah, you know? that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's why I see like with you, it's like this. You know, where you start, you're really pushing and out how you you evolve your music compositionally. It's still you, you know. It's there's a thread. But it's like it's like a dough or something being <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but oh, uh, I, you know, I wanted to ask you about it. You know, you were an act and then came to ECM. So, uh, what does that mean for you? You know, ECM has been so important for European jazz. I mean, in the last twenty years, also for American jazz, actually. But uh, working with Manfred, you know, who's been basically so important for Jared and Chick and everyone, basically, these incredible pianists. And uh, how was that like for you in, in your mind, you know, when he approached you? Or, I know you did the album Farsight with Roscoe, I guess this was the first mm -hmm. encounter, but. Yeah, I mean, the basically like with ACT, I was at a moment where I could have renewed my, I, I, my contract had was up for renewal or whatever they call it, you know, um, you know, basically the initial contract was three records. And then in the midst of that, they added the solo album as a separate deal. So I had done four with act. I guess I was starting to feel on act that like, it was weird to be the only American on the label, you know, and, and, and I would feel often that, my stuff would kind of take a back seat to European musicians mm, in the way they would promote stuff. And meanwhile, they had zero US presence. So like all the publicity and stuff I had to pay for here, you know? Oh shit. Oh yeah. That's bad. Yeah. Um, you know, it did well. Those albums did very well here uh, in terms of critics, you know, very much, kicked things into high gear for me yeah sure um but i felt anyway i just was exploring what else was out there and uh so my manager emailed ecm office and they got back to us in like 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> so like, if after like years of not getting answers from them suddenly they were like we'll take it <laughs> yeah, they were interested. so um so then we started talking about possibilities. And for me, like part of the other thing, you know, it's funny because actually even in this conversation, we've mostly been talking about the, the stuff of mine that's like most visible in the jazz business, you know, like piano trios mm -hmm. going around and playing and 
jazz festivals and jazz clubs and stuff and winning jazz awards. Uh, but I've been doing a lot of other things that don't figure into that world or that discourse, you know. And so that was part of what was like kind of driving me crazy is that I had to like hide these other parts of myself to be on a jazz label, you know. So for ECM, like part of what was exciting to me was that I could kind of do a lot of different things mm. and they would sort of make sense because, you know, it's funny, you think of it as a European jazz, you know, like a label that's been important for European jazz. And that's certainly true. And you also mentioned Keith and Chick, and that's also certainly true. Um, in fact, Keith was like the backbone of that label for it. You know, they he put out like 70 or 80 albums on that label, you know. Um, but for me, actually, like my, my first exposure to that label was through Art Ensemble of Chicago. <laughs> yeah, okay. Who, you know, Roscoe Mitchell, I ended up working with, as you know. Yeah. Uh, my first thing on ECM was on a Rosco, one of Roscoe's records. Um, and, uh, so I remember in the eighties, I was finding like art ensemble albums and Lester Bowie albums and Don Cherry albums and, yeah. um, Mal Waldron, you know, um, basically like to me, the black avant-garde of that moment, you know, of those years seemed to find, uh, place there. seemed to, you know, that was like kind of my first dose of it, you know. Mm, interesting. And then it was like, okay, there's all so then there was Keith and the other stuff. Um and part, you know, even like for me, what made that those first Keith Jarrett trio albums so exciting and kind of linked it to that other world that I was talking about was Jack. <laughs> Cause Jack was also an early AC AACM member. Yeah, yeah. You know, and sure. he was like in in league with all those guys and then you'd see like the special edition albums with david murray or with yeah. you know uh, with uh um osby, osby. <laughs> like yeah, you know yeah. there was like yeah marvin sewell gary thomas like these people yeah. like the these people were pretty left of the mainstream you know so that and and then like the the rhythmic energy he brought to Keith's records from that era I was like yeah you know that's still like really cutting edge when you listen to it <laughs> you yeah, know? He's, yeah there's there's hardly yeah. anyone who ever accomplished that you know <laughs> like on on the drums so yeah um so I was kind of getting that you know I remember then there was that um uh there were a couple of things of Pats that I checked out as well around that time. But, um, but for me, it was often like the, anyway, it was like the, the more for me, like what the history of that, of that label is, is like, it may, it gave a certain kind of home for the black avant-garde. Interesting. That, well, to me, okay. it was really important that became like, most people played a role in my life. A lot of them, you know, Roscoe, Wadada. Wadada, yeah. Sure. I mean, Wadada's first album up for ECM called Divine Love is one of the greatest albums of all time. Like you should you should check it out if you haven't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so that was kind of um that gave me a different sense of what they or even like Conference of the Birds, you know, that record. Oh wow. that's one of my or, favorites, yeah. I mean that's... Yeah, with Sam Rivers and Braxton on there, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. or Circle. <laughs> the yeah, first yeah. circle or Very. like the circle live in paris that stuff is wild man and it's like yeah, braxton and, is like yeah. pushing it into this other space that stuff was really exciting to me or marion brown afternoon of a Georgia yeah Fall yeah band. sure and dave holland's quintets in the yes, 80s yeah. i love that stuff yeah so, yeah yes yeah, yeah, so that stuff too like smitty on those yeah. records That's... or triplicate yeah, Jack's thing with Dave and it was Dave Holland's trio. Yeah, yeah, triplicate that thing with Jack and Steve, you know, and then uh, extensions, the one with 
Smitty, Kevin, and Steve, and, Ke and uh, Kevin Eubanks. Yeah. Those were all really influential to me, like more than Chicks records on ECM. Oh, interesting. Um, and that also kind of, it was partly like what I was, uh, when I was in college, late 80s, early 90s, I used to subscribe to the Village Voice. So I'd actually get it in the mail. It's a New York, like it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, I, I remember it. But it, uh, it was like, you know, this New York Weekly with a lot of political and cultural and arts coverage, free, had all the music listings. And um, my, who this guy became a dear friend of mine, passed away a year ago, Greg Tate, one of the great music writers, cultural critics of all time, <laughs> was uh, he would write about music in there. And also Gary Giddens was writing about music. Mm. And so between them, I got a lot of sense of what was up, you know. Um, but Greg in particular had such a roving sensibility. I mean, he could write about Cecil and then he could write about Prince, like in the same place, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it wasn't. Um, so that was like that for me kind of connected a lot of dots. You know, he was a real key figure for me in, in my aesthetics you know, just like orienting myself about around who was doing what anyway you were asking about ecm i'm sorry i went off no, no, no. Uh, I, just, I could listen to um, you for hours man it's just like, <laughs> like really it's so interesting uh what i was going to say is that what i was saying is that like i had um you know there was also like they were they had this thing called the new series which yeah. was like not always contemporary classical music, but basically like stuff that would otherwise be filed under classical, you know? And so the fact that I had this wide footprint in terms of, both in terms of like the range of so-called jazz and creative music that it was covering, but also in the classical world, they'd, they'd be like, you know, um, some medieval stuff and then like Meredith Monk and Steve Wright mm -hmm. and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So, Definitely. so that, it, that, that I could all live in one place was really important to me, you know, and then like a lot of elder musicians who I cherished and, and then a lot of my peers were also on the label. Like, you know, I mentioned that by among elders, it was Billy Hart, for example, sure. and yeah. Roscoe and, uh, and um, and then like Craig and David Reyes and yeah but, yeah you know people who are in my world I felt just more it felt more at home for me you know where I could also then do my music on my terms you know yeah, yeah different stuff yeah so that's you know um, and in terms of working with Manfred I mean he's made like 1600 albums you know so and they really all over the map there's not one aesthetic there's not one ecm sound it's really all kinds of things and so actually my in my experience and this is maybe because by the time i started working with him i'd already made like 17 or 18 albums of my own but uh we just sort of meet artist to artist you know and it's like um we have a kind of like very creative discussion about what would suit this music best, you know? And so oh. then and it was actually his idea to like, when I started working with ECM, or, you know, making albums with ECM that um, it was his idea to start with mutations. You know, oh. I had sent him a few different things I was doing and one fine day he phoned and said like, I've decided that we're going to start with mutations. I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't realize you're going to take it that seriously, but all right, let's do it. So, so then it was like me and a string quartet as my ECM debut, which then was like kind of, uh, it scrambled some signals for some people. They were yeah. like, uh, they were like, what? He just made a cello rondo and now he's doing this. Like, what is it? You know? And, um, you know, the critics even, I remember Jazz Times called that album a failure. You know, like oh, oh, shit. Oh, oh. I've never seen that in any review anywhere. 
calling your record a failure have you ever seen that's like one of the worst things you could possibly say about anything you know uh that, that was extreme i was like wow emotions are running hot here like what's going on so um so anyway uh but because like now we've made seven things and an eighth one in the can like it's uh and also different like yeah. a pretty interesting range yeah. that we've been able to cover it, like quite a lot of ground has been covered trio album sextet album yeah duets with craig and with wadada wadada yeah um the soundtrack and the, the soundtrack and the film rade rade um mutations uh then the trio with you know with yeah. Sean and linda, and linda yeah. so yeah like it's it's like I, I think it's just more it's a little more liberating the one thing is like being on the schedule of, <laughs> of like a uh, label that's putting out quite a lot of music, you know, like yeah, fifty albums a year or something like that, you know. So um, yeah. yeah, but it's still a nice company. Being. Oh man, it's. I mean, I usually buy an ECM album just because I know it's gonna be good. So I mean, it's hard <laughs> to hard. It's hard to miss with with an ECM album, honestly. So, but uh, VJ, not. I mean, I, I could ask you tons of questions, but that means we could talk here for hours. But just to, to you know, uh, all these different directions that you do. Just uh, if you give me a glimpse of human archipelago, I know you, this is going to keep you busy in January, I guess, and in mm. 2023 also. Uh, What's uh, very well, shortly like, the story behind it? I mean, like, and how oh, did yeah. you I mean, decide to do it? So, I was uh, invited and commissioned by this cellist, a wonderful cellist, Inval Segev. Yeah. Um, she lives here in New York, and she had heard other um, works of mine, including the violin concerto I wrote for Jennifer Coe, which was 2017. It premiered. And, uh, you know, she just liked, she liked it. <laughs> she liked my, the way I approach that, those formats, you know, like how I write for classical ensembles yeah, and soloists. Yeah. So it was really that, you know, um, I kind of got lucky that somebody, uh, wanted to pursue something like that with me. And so that, um, became a kind of, big project over the last year I'd say and I mainly wrote it um from about like late 21 into the first the whole first half of 22 I took my time with it I had to kind of I mean I grew up playing violin and so I have a sense about string instruments mm -hmm. I've written a lot for string quartets and and actually in 21 I as a sort of warm-up piece I wrote a short duet for her and me to play and um in the course of that i got a sense of her as a musician and as a player as a spirit you know and part of what what grabbed me is that she could she has perfect pitch so then she could basically she could play by ear you know <laughs> so then i was like actually let me see if i can use that <laughs> so um, and, you know, and often when I'm writing for these formats for like classical ensembles and soloists, I'll, I'll often kind of incorporate, I'm not like going to ask them to play over giant steps or something, but I might like incorporate some real time stuff, like some kind of strategies for generating material or for like synchronizing or harmonizing, mm. you know, or like even something simple, like play in unison with this person you know by ear like then you guys merge that these two two or more musicians can merge that way so then i started the, i've used strategies like that and you know it's in mutations it's in yeah. other um chamber pieces of mine and i wanted to see like can we do that on the scale of an orchestra you know and then like i was also around that time um in conversation with a dear friend of mine, the writer Teju Cole, and we were talking about um, 
these twin crises of climate change and mm. uh, human migration, like mass migration, that's often as a result, like people fleeing disaster, yeah. you know. Um, and that that's basically going to be the what characterizes the 21st century, just a, a lot more of that, you know. Um, and that's our that's humankind's fault. <laughs> it's also our then our collective responsibility to each other. You know? So then I was thinking about that as a sort of uh, environment in which I'm creating this piece. And I was like, well, um, I don't want to just make it kind of about something. I kind of wanted mm. to dramatize or stage a certain kind of encounter um, of different peoples, you know, like different yeah. uh, sensibilities, different communities, uh, different uh, ways of being in the world. Um, and in particular, to have a certain like, so there's the sort of systematized orchestral music that's like you know through composed everyone has a part they're like very intricate you can massage the dynamics like and all that stuff to sort of very precise carefully put together textures and so on and then there's this other population <laughs> which is the, you know i call them the travelers mm. the small like a mini ensemble of players who only play by ear and are using they're basically asked to play in unison in different ways you know yeah. given different constraints and they're cued in and out and stuff but they end up having a very different kind of presence in the group and then there's a the soloist so then it's about how all these this different direct yeah. well, beings uh these different ways of being kind of um interact and stuff. Well. Is this going to be released on an album or come to Europe as well or any of these? Uh, well, the premiere was in London in October and then there'll be some performances this winter. Uh, but we did record it in London. It's oh, okay. actually going to be her album, probably. Oh, okay. But she, cool. Yeah, she just recorded the... it and she's going to pair it with some other piece of repertoire. Probably. So Fantastic. Super. Sir? Oops, did I... Oh, yeah. Did I well, freeze? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so that's, you know, it's just one. Often when I, when I am in the kind of classical music um, world or community or system or business or whatever you want to call it. Territory, yeah. Uh, um, I find myself kind of wanting to mess with it a little bit. You know, like like uh not take it for granted as this territory to conquer or something like that or as somewhere to uh, just like achieve something but actually to kind of critique it yeah um in different ways you know i don't know if it really it's a it's a kind of challenge because like by critiquing it you end up then being in it in a way that's and I'm uh, so I'm kind of like navigating that fine line of being in but not of that world, you know. Yeah, but it's good you're doing it. And like you said, you know, you have this wide range of music that you want to explore, and that's if you can do that, that's amazing. You know, that's the best to evolve. Well, I've been lucky. I've been yeah. Lucky. <laughs> Cool, Vijay. Thanks so much, man, for yeah. taking the time and uh, hope to catch you in Europe soon next year. So. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate um, it. Oh, well, you know, one thing I meant to mention, which I didn't at all, <laughs> is that actually the next album is um, it's with the vocalist Aru Jafta. So she and I and this bassist um, Shazad Ismaili yeah. uh, made an album that's coming out in March on oh, Verve. Really? Because oh, well. she's on Verve, so it ended up being a Verve thing. So that'll be, um, that's a really beautiful thing oh. that we're doing. I really am excited about that project and the album. And we'll be touring. We'll be coming to Europe in May. 
Oh man, I have to ca- I'll check out the dates to catch you. Yeah. Maybe if you're in Vienna or something, definitely. Yeah, we will be. I think Chris, somewhere near there in early May. Super. I'll, I'll definitely. Okay. If you are, I'll, I'll try to catch you. So. And, uh, okay. So thanks so much, Sounds man. Good. Yeah. Uh, Thank keep you. it keep it strong nice and to meet you. yeah, you too. And uh, hope in Europe <laughs> we drink a beer together or something. So. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Take cool, care. Man. You too. Mm-hmm.